Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Hawes, and I'm the Director of Co Consumer Information at Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. Thank you for joining us today for the 17th Annual CAPS Policy Lecture. Today's webinar will be recorded. During the webinar, you may submit a question at any time, either using the Q&A button or the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We have staff monitoring the questions and chat to convey your questions to our presenters, as well as to answer any technical questions that you may have. You can turn on captions by selecting the live transcript button, which is the button with two C's at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to tweet us today during the lecture, please use our Twitter handle at BenRose1908, and our event hashtag is hashtag CAPSLecture. I'd now like to turn it over to our president and CEO, Orion Bell, who will introduce today's lecture and our keynote speaker. Orion? Great. Thanks so much, Ashley. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Orion Bell, and I am the president and CEO here at the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. And we want to thank you for joining us today at Benjamin Rose for our 17th annual CATS Policy Lecture, which is Safe, Affordable, and Accessible Housing for Older Adults. The Katz Policy Lecture was established in 2007 in honor of the late Dr. Sidney Katz, who was Benjamin Rose's distinguished scholar, and the lecture convenes advocates to explore potential policy approaches to important issues of aging. Dr. Katz was a physician, a scientist, a teacher, a mentor, an author, and a public servant who pioneered the concept of active aging, championed the development of the field of geriatric care and was the primary author of the concept of activities of daily living. The Katz family has remained strong advocates and supporters of our work throughout the years. And today we want to remember Dr. Katz's wife, Beverly, as someone who shared with us her, her joy that made possible all the contributions for Dr. Katz. This year's lecture will examine issues around housing for older adults. It's my great honor to introduce this year's Katz lecturer, Ms. Diane Yentel. Diane is the president and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition, a membership organization that's dedicated to achieving racially and socially equitable public policy that ensures people with the lowest incomes have quality homes that are accessible and affordable in the communities of their choice. With more than 25 years of experience working with affordable housing, Diane is a leader and a national expert on housing insecurity and homelessness. Under her leadership, the NLIHC has deepened, broadened, and strengthened the movement for housing justice, leading major national campaigns to achieve historic federal protections and investments for low-income renters and people experiencing homelessness during the pandemic. In her role, Diane works closely with members of Congress, with the White House, numerous federal agencies, and partners and allies throughout the country. She holds a bachelor's degree from the State University of New York at Stony Brook, and a master's degree in social work from the University of Texas at Austin. Please join me in welcoming Diane Yentel. Hello, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. It's really my pleasure. Um, as you heard, at the National Income Housing Coalition, we focus on households with the lowest incomes. And we focus on them specifically, uh, including many seniors in our country, uh, because they are the only segment of the population for which there is an absolute shortage of affordable and available homes. And today I wanna to talk a little bit about how and why that shortage of homes for the lowest income people has worsened in recent years and what we need to do to reverse this trajectory. So these last few years really have been a watershed moment in our work and in our country. The pandemic years have shown us in profound and unforgettable ways, the importance of home and, and also what we can achieve when we work together. The pandemic years revealed the collective harm that comes from allowing homelessness and housing poverty to persist and to make clear that housing is health care. It has always been so. And that stable, affordable, accessible homes are a prerequisite to personal and public health. The years showed us 
how quickly and effectively the country can, when it has the will, implement emergency protections and resources to keep renters and people experiencing homelessness safe, healthy, and housed. And the years really showed us as housing advocates, organizers, providers, impacted people, just how deep and broad is our movement for housing justice and how powerful and effective we can be when we work together. Because as difficult as the years were, we rose to the challenge and we achieved unprecedented resources and protections for renters and unhoused people. But now, as these resources have been spent and the protections have expired, the housing and homelessness crises have worsened. And as always, it's the lowest income and the most vulnerable people that bear the brunt. Next slide, please. So even before the pandemic, millions of extremely low-income households who are disproportionately people of color struggled to remain housed and more than half a million people experienced homelessness. So when I talk about extremely low-income households, I mean a family of four with two working parents who bring in a combined $25,000 in annual income. Or I mean a senior or a person with disabilities on extremely limited fixed income of around twelve dollars to $15,000 a year. So this image in this slide comes from the National Low Income Housing Coalition's annual study, The Gap, where we quantify the shortage of homes affordable and available to the lowest income people. So before the pandemic, we had a shortage of about 7 million homes affordable and available to those households. So another way of saying that same number is for every 10 of the lowest income households, there are fewer than four apartments that are affordable and available to them. And you can see from this map that the shortage ranges from most severe to least severe, but there is no state that has a sufficient number of homes for its lowest income people. Next slide, please. And because of the shortage, 10 million of the lowest income households pay at least half of their very limited incomes on rent. And as you can see from this image, the vast majority of households in our country that are severely cost burdened, that is paying at least half of their income to begin, uh, half of their income to keep a roof over their heads, are extremely low or very low income. Next slide, please. And you can see from this slide that about one third of all extremely low income households are seniors. Next slide. So this next slide, this one comes from another research report that the National Low Income Housing Coalition publishes every year called Out of Reach. And in this report, we, um, we come up with what we call the housing wage, which is how much somebody needs to earn an hour just to be able to afford to rent a modest one or two bedroom apartment. So this slide here shows how rent costs compare with various incomes for extremely low income households and others. And you can see here that the bottom two bars show nationally on average what it costs to rent a modest one or two bedroom apartment. In some areas, of course, these rents are much higher than shown on this, this national average. Um, and the top bar, as you can see, shows the amount that a senior on SSI can afford to pay. So just a tremendous gap between what the lowest income households earn or otherwise bring in as income and what rent costs. Next slide, please. So when you have such limited incomes to begin with and you pay so much of it on your rent, you are always one financial shock, right? A broken down car, a new needed medication, an unexpected bill, away from missing rent, facing eviction, and in worst cases, becoming homeless. So this is why we have homelessness in our country. It's why we have housing poverty. And it's why those 10 million households are right on the cusp of potentially losing their homes. Next slide, please. So we have homelessness and housing poverty in our country really for two main reasons. One is a basic market failure. 
the private market on its own cannot feasibly build and operate homes that are affordable to households with such low incomes because what they can pay in rent doesn't cover the costs. This is a basic market failure that requires government intervention in this form in the case of subsidies. But the second main reason why we have homelessness and housing poverty is because despite this very clear and growing need, the federal government funds a system where only one in every four households gets the housing assistance that they need. So think about that for a second. 75% of people in our country who are in need of and eligible for housing assistance get none. So unlike some other parts of our social safety net, like food assistance and to some extent health assistance, where funding is based on need, housing assistance has an arbitrary funding cap. And within that, it's first come first served. So those 75 households stand in line, waiting to add their names to years, sometimes decades long waiting lists, hoping to win what's essentially a housing lottery system, where only the lucky 25% get the help that they need in our country. So all of this was the case in 2019. And then of course came a global pandemic. And with it, some of the most severe housing needs that our country has seen in generations. Next slide, please. So in August of 2020, the best available data made clear that up to 12 million households, including many seniors and people with disabilities, were at risk of losing their homes if the government didn't act. So these were many of the same households who had struggled to pay the rent before the pandemic, including seniors working minimum wage jobs, but now they'd lost those jobs. They'd lost hours at work, they'd lost wages, and it was harder than ever for them to cobble together what they needed for rent with increased healthcare, internet, and other costs. So by August of 2020, the small patchwork of pandemic protections and resources had expired and renters really stood on the edge of a cliff. So advocates sounded the alarm and federal, state and local governments took heed and they provided historic protections and resources to keep tenants housed. Next slide, please. So together we fought for and we kept in place a national moratorium on evictions for non-payment of rent. This was historic unprecedented. In the history of our country, there has been nothing like such a broad protection to keep renters housed. And it worked. It cut eviction filing rates in half to their lowest on record. And against all odds, and despite some very powerful and well-funded opponents, we kept that moratorium in place for about a year. Together, we also achieved 46 and a half billion dollars in emergency rental assistance. Again, an unprecedented level of support for low-income renters. For perspective, it's more than 46 times what the federal government allocated to help renters during the Great Recession. And it was the largest single allocation of resources exclusively for renters in history. Next slide, please. So once we achieved these historic resources, the National Income Housing Coalition created our ERASE project to end rent arrears to stop evictions. And we worked together with the White House, Treasury, state and local partners, program administrators, impacted people to really build a new national infrastructure to get these vital resources to the tenants most in need to keep them stably housed. And we worked hard to make sure that those resources reached truly the most vulnerable people, the people most at risk of losing their homes, but for this emergency rental assistance. So we tracked and we analyzed over 500 programs throughout the country. We researched ERA implementation. We amplified best practices. Um, we worked with the White House to improve guidance and oversight. Next slide, please. And after much collective work, uh, the emergency rental assistance program is, is a success story to tell now. Today, over 12 million emergency rental assistance payments have been made. And the data make very clear 
that our collective efforts to make sure that these funds reached the lowest income and the most marginalized people worked. So the households that have received assistance are predominantly very low and extremely low income, and they are disproportionately people of color. So the very people most at risk of losing their homes during the pandemic were the beneficiary of these funds. And you know, this kind of successful alignment of major new resources with the people most in need, it doesn't happen by accident, right? It happens, and especially during such a, a, a time uh, crunch and such urgency. It happens only with very deliberate and purposeful program design and outreach as we and our partners uh, worked to do. We don't have a lot of data on senior households and emergency rental assistance. But one thing that we do know from best practices is that the fewer requirements to receive the funds, the more likely those funds are gonna reach some of the most vulnerable households, including seniors. So we do see in some cases where some emergency rental assistance had a lot of barriers and obstacles to receiving those funds, those are the programs that served the fewest seniors. The programs that made it very simple and accessible to apply for and receive those funds served more seniors. So certainly some lessons that we can apply across social safety net programs. Next slide, please. At the same time we were working on getting these funds out to the lowest income people, we were working with partners throughout the country to get states, state and local governments to do more to protect renters. So altogether, our partners and allies throughout the country advocated successfully for state and local governments to enact or implement over 200 new tenant protections since 2021 alone. And these are from, from just cause eviction protections to right to counsel, to the sealing of eviction records, to preventing rent gouging, these 200 new tenant protections are really shifting power in our housing system back to where it belongs with renters and with people who are experiencing homelessness. So all of this, all of this taken together, these historic resources, the successful outreach, the implementation of these programs, this is what prevented an eviction tsunami. This is what kept millions of families safely housed during the pandemic. But now, really significant new challenges are uh, await because the truth is that despite our success, renters, the lowest income renters, are struggling more than ever. And homelessness is growing in communities at alarming rates. Next slide, please. So in 2021 and 2022, just as pandemic help ended, steep rent hikes and in increased costs across the board squeezed people with the lowest incomes. And as effective and as important as emergency rental assistance and temporary eviction prote protections were to keep millions of people stably housed, they were only ever temporary patches to the gaping holes in our social safety net. And they didn't address really the deep flaws in our country's housing system that perpetually leaves millions of the lowest income people struggling to keep a roof over their heads. So now in those same communities where the rent, where rental protections have expired or emergency rental assistance has been depleted, eviction filings are surpassing pre-pandemic levels. And the predictable and tragic results is homelessness is increasing in communities across the country. A federal agency, the Government Accountability Office, has shown that every $100 per month median monthly rent increase is associated with a 9% increase in homelessness in that same community. And the, in the last two years, rents have increased on average by nearly $200 a month. So now we're seeing homelessness rates increasing 5%, 10%, 50%, even over 100% increases in some communities. And this then brings still more challenges, right? As homelessness increases and becomes increasingly visible, 
there has been a dangerous and growing backlash against proven solutions to ending homelessness and against people experiencing homelessness. So this backlash together with really the difficulty of providing quick solutions is causing political leaders of both parties and at all levels to make harmful decisions to address homelessness, often choosing to simply move people out of public view rather than addressing the underlying causes of homelessness. Next slide, please. And all of this should be a major concern for people who care about the well being of seniors because seniors are one of the fastest growing segments of the homeless population. Next slide, please. This is a projection of increased senior homelessness in three major cities from a 2019 study by Dr. Dennis Culhane, where he projects the aged homeless population will be triple in 2030, what it was in 2017. And this has tremendous implications for individuals, of course, but also for health systems, right? Older homeless adults have been shown to have medical ages that far exceed their biological ages. So medical conditions such as cognitive decline, decreased mobility rates in people who are homeless often compare to their housed counterparts who are 20 years older. So the being homeless ages people who are already seniors. Next slide, please. And all of this data really just means that many of our country's most vulnerable seniors are suffering the pain, sometimes the violence, the indignity of living on the street. This tweet and this photo comes from Mark Horvath who runs Invisible People and he does um, interviews and conversations with people who are homeless. Uh, this person picture here, Thomas, he's 72. He's homeless today. This picture is recent in San Diego. And the tweet talks about how, the challenges that he has with shelter and why he's left to pitch a tent on a sidewalk. And what's also happened to Thomas is because in San Diego, they're choosing to criminalize homelessness rather than resolve it. Thomas often has to pack up all of his things from the tent and move across the street to the other side of the street where he can pitch the tent again. But then a few days later, he has to move again. Next slide, please. So all of this obviously is, is deeply troubling and worrisome, but one of the most important things to know about everything I said today is that this crisis, the affordable housing and the homelessness crisis is entirely solvable. Ending homelessness and housing poverty isn't easy, but it's pretty simple. And we saw during the pandemic just what it takes, right, to keep people housed for the short term. And the long term solutions are pretty simple too. But it takes the political will to fund and implement them. And that's something that we don't have yet at the scale necessary. But the same long standing pre pandemic housing inequities will persist in or out of a pandemic unless and until policymakers at all levels enact robust tenant protections and invest in the long term solutions needed to make homes affordable for the lowest income people. So these are the solutions that we at the National Low Income Housing Coalition work towards for seniors and for all people struggling to make uh, to make rent cost, to pay the rent and to keep the roofs over their heads. So the first solution is to make rental assistance universally available to all eligible households in need. The second is that we need to preserve and expand the supply of homes especially to make them affordable to the lowest income people. We do that through preserving and expanding public housing, through a major expansion of the National Housing Trust Fund, and with federal requirements or incentives for local zoning reform. The third solution is we need a permanent emergency rental assistance program 
to ensure that renters can absorb a financial shock that otherwise could lead to eviction and the spiraling down into poverty that results after all the work that we collectively as a country put into building this new national infrastructure for emergency rental assistance and with clear evidence of its success, we have an obligation to continue it. And the fourth solution is to rebalance the power that currently tilts so heavily in favor of landlords at the expense of the lowest income renters through robust and enforced tenant protections. Next slide, please. So none of this or very little of this can be done without Congress. And that's where it becomes in many ways for now more difficult and more complicated. So House Republicans this year threatened to default on our nation's debt as leverage to demand really dramatic cuts to domestic investments, including those investments that get or keep the lowest income people stably housed. And we've seen this before, this same tactic of using negotiations around the debt ceiling to bring about steep reductions in federal spending was adopted by House Republicans back in 2011. And it resulted in a law called the Budget Control Act that led to 10 years of very low spending caps and made it impossible to fund solutions to America's housing and homelessness crisis at the scale needed. Next slide, please. So this slide shows some of the cuts early in the Budget Control Act, deep cuts to HUD's budget, to programs that get and, and keep low-income people housed. Those are the yellow lines on the left. The blue lines on the right show that in recent years, after the end of the Budget Control Act, we were able to get some increases to some key programs. But the dotted line on the bottom shows that even with those recent increases in some programs and HUD spending, we still haven't made up for the overall losses to HUD spending since the Budget Control Act uh, was put in place. And now the final debt deal that was agreed to by Congress and the White House will further cut these critical programs. But at the same time, we do have bipartisan support in the House and the Senate for some key affordable housing bills that would make a, a real difference, uh, uh, would be a real down payment towards our efforts to end homelessness. So we really have our work cut out for us in the coming months and years. Um, but really, despite the tremendous challenges that we have in front of us, I'm confident that we will make progress and that we will eventually end homelessness and housing poverty once and for all. Next slide, please. And the message really that I most wanna leave you with is that I'm confident because if there's one thing above all that we can take as a lesson learned from the pandemic, it's that advocacy works. And you know, I have, I have long said kind of in speech after speech, uh, conversation after conversation that the only thing we've ever lacked in our country to end homelessness and housing poverty once and for all is the political will. And the pandemic really proved it. When our movement for housing justice saw the danger that the pandemic posed, we aligned with a singular focus to protect people who were homeless and struggling renters, to save lives, and keep people stably housed, and we did. And when government at all levels recognized the emergency and the need, it acted and funded solutions on a scale unlike any in our lifetimes. Together in just two years, we achieved what we once would have considered unthinkable, impossible, so now on those days when our goals feel impossible, when the difficulties of the work and the challenges seem insurmountable, on those days when we feel like we can't or we won't, we should remember that we did. Together we achieved the, the unimaginable, we did the impossible. And I, I believe that together we can and we will do it again. Next and final slide. 
So I invite you all to join us in taking ad in, in advocating for the programs that can house seniors experiencing homelessness, that can keep vulnerable seniors in the homes that they already have to take action today. And you can use this QR code to go to a Legislative Action Center at the National Low Income Housing Coalition with some very specific actions that you can take today to help build the political will to make that happen. So thank you all for your attention and thanks again so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation. All right, I had, had to unmute myself. <laughs> Diane, thank you so much uh, for serving as our CATS policy lecturer uh, today. I um, want to begin by asking if there are any uh, questions in the chat or the Q&A for our speaker. Yeah, there are several questions that came in. Um, so there was a question um, wondering, is the problem more to do with rental costs or SNAP? stagnant wages? It's both. The problem is certainly an income issue where people's um, incomes aren't keeping up with rising renting rent uh, with rising rental costs. Um, but one of the things that we have done in our report out of reach, which I mentioned earlier, is we look at, for example, um, when we come up with what we call the housing wage, we include in it communities that have lifted their minimum wage. And in some cases, they've, they've increased it very significantly, twice what the, what the federal minimum wage is. And still in those places, housing for the lowest income people is far out of reach. So it's, it's, it's a problem on both sides. Uh, we do need to look for ways to increase income, uh, but even in places where they have, those housing costs remain out of reach for the lowest income people. So we have to look for ways to provide subsidies and make those apartments affordable to the lowest income people. Great, thanks so much. And I just wanted to let everyone know, um, we had this question come in a couple of times, but a recording of today's webinar will be shared with everyone and you are welcome to share it, you know, with friends, colleagues, um, other caregivers that you know in your lives. Um, and also um, a copy of the slides will be sent out as well. And if you do have any more questions, you can submit them either in the Q&A or in the chat, but there um, were a couple more questions that came in. So um, someone was wondering who is included in the renter protection. They said that they had a friend who worked on a student visa and this friend felt like they had no protection during the pandemic although they were paying taxes and doing things, you know, by the book. Yeah, so there's a there's a tremendous um, power imbalance in our housing system that tilts very heavily in favor of landlords and often at the expense of low-income renters and especially renters with the lowest incomes and some of the most marginalized people. So during the pandemic, the federal eviction moratorium was historic and it, it cut eviction filing rates in half, but it wasn't perfect. It was certainly flawed. And there were requirements that people had to take in order to receive that protection from the federal government. And again, going back to one of the, one of the lessons learned from pandemic programs, anytime we put up obstacles or requirements for people to access a protection, it means often people with the highest vulnerabilities um, are not able to get those protections. So it did protect um, really millions of households, but not everybody. There certainly were places, if it had protected everybody, eviction filing rates would have brought, been brought down further than being cut in half. Um, so lessons of universality of programs and making them more accessible to lowest income people, I think can certainly be taken. The other thing about tenant protections is that outside of the pandemic and that federal eviction moratorium, we have really a patchwork of protections of differing strength um, and with often very limited enforcement throughout the country. So that what that means is renters in some communities that 
uh, where there's been political will to put in place strong tenant protections and enforce them, they have greater housing stability than the many parts of the country where there are virtually no or literally no tenant protections at all, uh, or where there are tenant protections, but they're not enforced. So again, I think state and local, the state and local efforts to implement new tenant protections has been incredibly important, but mostly what we need is the federal government to act so that the kind of tenant protections that we need are universe, uh, uniformly applied across the country to all renters in need. And we still have a ways to go before we can get the federal government to act at that level. Thanks, Diane. Another great question. Um, someone was wondering, do you also advocate for low income housing tax credits that allow developers to work with communities to advance lower rent and lower cost apartments for seniors, persons with mental health conditions and persons with developmental disabilities? Yeah, the low income housing tax credit is an important program that provides the vast majority of federally funded affordable housing in our country. It on its own, it makes housing affordable to people who are at about 50 to 60 percent area median income. And our data show very clearly that the greatest need for housing affordability is among households who are at or below 30 percent area median income. Now, there are people who live in low income housing tax credits who are extremely low income, but they often have a Section 8 voucher in addition to the low income housing tax credit unit in order to make it affordable to them. So the, it's an important program that can be improved. And there's bipartisan legislation in the Senate and the House that would improve the program so that communities could use those housing credits to build more apartments that are affordable to those with the greatest and the clearest needs those folks who are at 30% or below area median income. Thank you. And someone was also wondering if you could speak to your um, experiences, whether low income older adult renters um, are ones that have been lifelong renters or are there intermediate steps that sometimes occur between low income home ownership and low income rentership? Yeah, so I, some, I don't have the specific data, but I'd say in general, some have been lifelong uh, renters. Oftentimes, um, seniors who are now renters or extremely low income renters are people who may have had a significant change in their household income earlier on related to a death or a divorce um, that led to somebody's income really going down much lower than they had ever planned leading them to um, go into the rental market and sometimes to be extremely low income there. Or in other cases, we've seen among the aging baby boomer population, people wanting to downsize. So people who were previously homeowners and can no longer take care of the large homes or properties who decide to instead move into the rental housing market. Understood, thank you for that. Um, and then, the next question is about accessibility needs. So um, this participant wanted to know, um, well, they said um, that the accessibility needs of homeless seniors are obviously huge. They wanted to know if you could speak about what specific policies are being created to address this growing need. Accessibility is a huge challenge um, for seniors and people with disabilities, of course, in our housing market, both in the private housing market and um, in some cases in our subsidized housing market where we are not building enough apartments that are affordable as I shared, but also that are accessible for people um, who need them. One really important piece of this is to preserve the accessible housing that we do have in our country, which is often in the form of public housing. So public housing um, has more units of accessible homes or larger apartments, both of which uh, seniors sometimes need, especially seniors who are taking care of grandchildren. Um, those accessible or larger apartments are, are disproportionately found in public housing than other subsidized housing or within the private market. But public housing is in a state overall of disrepair and needs a tremendous infusion of public funds 
to preserve and ensure that we're not losing those accessible units. So we need to do more to be building more um, or, or um, converting existing units into accessible units. But really most important, we need to make sure that we're not losing the very limited accessible housing stock that we have. And related to that, someone asked, how does ADUs and house modification help? Well, with a with a with a crisis as big as ours, and with a gap as large as we have now, with with a short a shortage in the millions of homes needed for the lowest income people, every kind of solution we can come up with to make homes affordable for the lowest income people helps. So ADUs, accessible dwelling units, where people and it can help in two ways. It can help with seniors who are homeowners but can have part of their property rented out that can be an income source that can help seniors in retirement, um, but it can also provide for more affordable housing in a community. Um, two sort of cautions on that. One is that it's not something that can um, address the challenge on the scale that exists, but again, any kind of um, intermediate solutions can be helpful, but it also points back to the need for localities to do more to get rid of restrictive local zoning that is a big driver of the housing crisis overall. Um, when local communities have, have very strict local zoning laws that don't allow for affordable apartments to be built or for communities to have ADUs, then that worsens the challenge. So it, it, ADUs is a good example of the multiple ways that we need to address the crisis. We need to look for small scale ways that we can make a difference in our community. We need to look at how local zoning is contributing or can help alleviate the problem. And we need to get the federal government to provide solutions at the scale necessary. Thank you for clarifying that for us. We do have time for more questions, so please make sure um, that you are submitting those in the Q&A and in the chat. We had someone ask, what can be done to place a limit on cost of rent? And what can be done to stop landlord or landlords, excuse me, um, ending low income housing and changing the market value? Yeah, those are, those are very good questions. Um, there are some places that are starting to, um, starting to try different types of, sometimes it's called rent control, sometimes it's called rent stabilization, sometimes it's called anti-rent gouging. And each of them really is different. It's kind of a different degree um, of to which you control the level that a landlord can increase rents. And there's a lot of controversy around that particular policy solution. Some limited research that shows that the most um, the that that shows that rent control that doesn't allow for rents to go above even three uh, percent can actually, in the long term, mean less housing overall and less affordable housing because owners might convert their properties to be condos or get out of the rental mar housing market altogether. There's also research that shows when you allow for some level of rent increases for the landlords to be able to cover the increasing costs maybe of maintaining those properties, but not allow for those rent increases to go beyond those cost needs, that that can really be a benefit um, to the renters who live there and not have those harmful long-term repercussions. So we've pushed for, there. there's really no way to make a valid case for rent increases of 20, 25, 30%, like we saw over the last two years. Um, that's, that's going to as high as the market will allow. It doesn't have to do with what a landlord actually needs to, make, to maintain those properties. So we've pushed for anti-rent gouging to prohibit that kind of really exorbitant rent increases. And there are some places, even the state of Texas uh, that prevents rent gouging after major disasters, natural disasters. Um, and so we've made the case that certainly after a global pandemic, a similar kind of protection could have been put in place and would have made a real difference for uh, the renters who are struggling today. 
Okay, thank you. And, and this is kind of a, a different topic than you've touched on before. Um, this attendee said low income older adults or low income, whether they live in large cities or suburbs. Research indicates having affordable housing in suburbs improves quality of life and health. So their question is, why is there a lack of affordable housing in the suburbs and what needs to be done to have more affording housing in these areas? Sure. Well, you know, if we go back to the map that I showed early on, there's a lack of housing affordable for the lowest income people everywhere, um, certainly in every state. And if I showed a different map from our out of reach data, it would show that there's uh, virtually no congressional district, even down to the metro level area where the very lowest income, lowest wage or lowest income households can afford an apartment. So it's a it's an urban, suburban and rural issue um, across the board. We do see uh, some federal housing programs like public housing that was most of it was built decades ago um, that is uh, more concentrated in urban areas, but a lot of um, low income housing tax credits and increasingly um, building through what's called the National Housing Trust Fund is happening in uh, suburban and rural areas too. There are, especially when it comes to rural areas, there's increased challenges to using some of these federal resources, but there's efforts to improve the programs to make it easier. But the, the housing shortage really exists across the country and in all types of communities when it comes to looking at uh, people with the lowest incomes. Thank you for that clarification. Um, if you will continue to submit your questions, we will make sure we um, have time to have those answered for you. Um, this next um, attendee had a comment. They said public housing is often not a safe alternative. A senior who has never lived in public housing would not be moving to public housing as an alternative. Could you speak to um, this opinion, Diane? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I think um, in, in Often that's said about public housing. And when you look closer, you see the data and the evidence um, is counter to that. So it really depends on which public housing development. There are so many across the country um, where it's located, the community that it sits within and challenges that that community might be facing. So it really, really varies. Um, there are many public housing developments that where there have been investments in recent years that are quite beautiful, that are in neighborhoods with low crime rates and um, and other you know so-called communities of opportunity, um, and often you wouldn't be able to tell which of those apartments are public housing or low-income housing tax credit compared to the private market. There's other public housing certainly that has been around for many many decades and hasn't been invested in that's in a state of disrepair. Um, but there are a large number of seniors that live in public housing. There is a small sort of set aside program within the larger public housing program that allows for communities to have certain buildings within a property for seniors only or for people with disabilities only. And this gets complicated with, with federal fair housing laws, but there are there is some recognition certainly that seniors or people with disabilities um, have additional needs, uh, certainly seniors, well, both seniors and disabilities may need supportive services with their housing in order to stay there. Um, so there are some ways to kind of carve out a specific property within a public housing development to be just for seniors and or seniors with disabilities. But overall, um, there are a number of seniors that live in public housing and that apply to live in public housing and find a lot of um, stability once they're able to get in. Thank you. Those are all really great points. Next, um, we were wondering, um, should states be looking hard at tax credits to spur a variety of new housing development for older adults? Are there other better statewide incentives that should be looked at instead? There are a wide variety of state and local efforts to get new resources to build and operate apartments um, for people who are for seniors, for people with disabilities, for specific subsets of the population or for overall um, for extremely low income people. And those, it can vary from during the pandemic and still a lot of communities have really significant resources from this 
big pot of money that was called the State and Local Fiscal Relief Fund that could have been used for a very wide variety of purposes, including affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Some communities set aside some of those funds um, to build apartments or to convert hotels or empty uh, retail properties into apartments. Um, some communities do pass bond measures or new local taxes. Some kind, sometimes those taxes are related to new mortgages in the community. So there's, there's a whole really range of, um, it's kind of a menu of possibilities to get new state and local resources for affordable housing. And there's many communities that have done so. We keep track of a lot of that um, on our website. If you went to the National Local Housing Coalition's website, you could find some of the um, best practices that we've put out and some of the lessons learned from states and localities looking for new revenue sources for affordable housing for seniors. Thank you. And we'll be sure to put that website in the chat here momentarily. We do have time for a couple more questions. Um, so um, this um, attendee, um, they um, were talking about philanthropy. So they said that they recognize that philanthropy cannot even come close to fill the gap that federal legislation and federal funding needs to fill. Nevertheless, they were curious to hear your thoughts on the areas in housing where philanthropy can most effectively focus our relatively more limited dollars to address this issue. Well, you know, I may be biased, but I think um, the best investment for philanthropists who want to impact the housing crisis is to fund organizing and advocacy, because ultimately, as, as this person says, philanthropy cannot fill the gap in funding or in, um, in fun certainly not in funding the construction or the operation of affordable housing. It's very limited what, what philanthropy can do there. But philanthropy could have a big impact in supporting local organizers, state, local, and national advocates who can push federal, state, and local governments to provide solutions at the scale necessary. Thank you. And it looks like that is the last question. Um, so um, unless I missed any, all of the questions um, have now been answered. If you have any last minute question, I'm just going to give you a moment or two to go ahead and submit that. And we will definitely, you know, take the time to get your question answered. So let me just double check if any more came in. All right. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Orion, who's going to begin um introducing our reactor panelists for today again thank you diane for such a wonderful presentation thank you Orion, would you like to go ahead and unmute and introduce uh -oh, everybody? There today? we go. That's <laughs> there you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> Technical <laughs> difficulties today. Yeah. I don't you. think it's I think that's user error, but that, <laughs> thank you for pointing it out. All right. So anyway, uh, I, as I was saying, we we are blessed with a wonderful reactor panel today to have some follow-up conversation with Diane and her presentation. Um and this time I'm really going to introduce the names. So our first our first panelist is uh, Frank Ford. And Frank is Senior Policy Advisor at the Fair Housing Center and Chair of the Greater Cleveland Vacant and Abandoned Property Action Council. Uh, Frank began conducting housing research in 1993, and his research has been published by Harvard University and reported on by national news media. Since 2016, he has been issuing regular reports on bank lending, housing market recovery, property tax delinquency, and other housing indicators in the Cleveland neighborhoods and the Cuyahoga County suburb level. Frank is a graduate of Kenyon College with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English, and he received his Juris Doctorate degree from Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Welcome, Frank. Uh, next, our second panelist is Sally Martin O'Toole. Sally was appointed uh, by the city of Cleveland as, as the Ohio's, uh, uh, sorry, by the city of Cleveland as its director of building and housing in February of 22. 
She uh, oversees code enforcement activities and construction permitting, and previously served as the housing director for the city of South Euclid from 2008 until 2022, where she led housing programs and how to housing code enforcement for the city, and was one of the founders of the city's affiliate nonprofit community development corporation. In addition, she serves on various housing policy groups and boards. She is a graduate of the University of Florida. Welcome, Sally. Uh, our third panelist today uh, is Antoinette Smith, who is Director of Housing and Financial Counseling for Empowering and Strengthening Ohio's People here at the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging, where she oversees all of our housing and financial counseling programs and reporting. Antoinette has more than two decades of experience in direct service for clients with multiple needs in, related to finances, housing, and health. Antoinette is a HUD certified counselor and earned her bachelor's degree in nonprofit administration from Cleveland State University. She's active board member for Changing Lives Foundation and is the executive council member of Prevent Blindness Ohio here, uh, the chapter here in Ohio. Welcome, Antoinette. Then our final panelist today is Barbara Anderson. Uh, Barbara is the chair of the Greater Cleveland Reinvestment Coalition and founder and chairperson of Another Chance Ohio. As the former treasurer and president of ESOP, she assisted in negotiation with mortgage servicers and banks that resulted in millions of dollars being reinvested in low-income neighborhoods, forged agreements that returned money to the victims of predatory lending and helped those in foreclosure or bankruptcy to modify loans resulting from abusive practices in the lending industry. Barbara serves on various committees addressing the needs and issues around vac vacant and abandoned and vandalized property and the best land use resulting from demolition in the community. So, uh, so we have a, a wonderful panel. We've had a, an amazing speaker. And so I look forward to really a uh, exciting conversation from the group. Um, I want to pose a question for each of you, and then we will go from there. Uh, so my, my question for the group is, we know from a lot of our research that most older adults tell us that their intention is to age in place as they grow older, but nearly half of the same group worries they won't be able to do so. Uh, from your perspectives, what do you see as barriers to aging in place from the perspective of the programs and the clients that you operate with? I'm willing to go first if you want me to. Great. Um, so, so I tend to think of this as the seniors, the older adults that are renters, and then looking at the older adults that are homeowners. And I've got several things that they're, they're really in line with what Diane's already said, but they have more of a local uh, spin on them with local data. Uh, the first thing is I took a look at census data <clears throat> comparing incomes and rents from 2010 to 2021 and rents uh, are outpacing incomes. And particularly in the east side of Cleveland, which is 80% uh, African-American. But <clears throat> so that's similar, it's consistent with what Diane has said with rents going up, but <clears throat> the data shows that people's incomes are not keeping up with rents. The second thing is that we've had a significant increase in investor acquisitions of property in the last decade and this is of course true in other places around the country but it's pretty severe here that the investor ownership of property has tripled in Cuyahoga County over approximately the last 10 years and just in 2020 alone on the east side of Cleveland which as I mentioned was 80 percent African-American uh 45 percent of all the properties purchased in 2021 2020 excuse me were by investors. So it's a significant issue. The third thing with regard to renters uh, is that in, even though we have these first two things, which are obviously creating hardships, I should mention that investors, their business model is mostly to acquire property for rental. Um, the uh, loss of our community, our Cleveland Tenants Organization, we used to have a, for decades, we had a Cleveland Tenants Organization that provided counseling, did organizing, advocacy, would refer people to legal assistance. That went away, um, I'm saying five or more years ago. And that's a significant issue that we don't have at a time when we really need the Cleveland Tenants Organization or something like it. So with respect to older adults being owners, uh, the data suggests that uh, since 
2019, um, the tax delinquency for older adults went from uh, 25 million in Cuyahoga County to 33 million. So there's a significant issue with uh, older adults who are owners getting behind in their property tax. Uh, the next one and last one I'll mention is uh, data also shows that older adults who own their homes, those homes uh, since 2015, uh, comparing a property survey from 2015 with 2023, the older adults, their properties are have suffered some decline. Uh, the, the survey rated properties as either A or B, C or D or F. A, B, A and B properties are in good repair, generally. C properties are the ones that most likely need home repairs. D and F are really severely distressed and might even require demolition. But the C rated properties for older adults doubled between 2015 and 2023. So we have really a significantly increased need for resources for home repair for older adults. Let me stop because I just threw out a bunch of things and we want, I know you wanna to get to other people and I will address, so what do we do about that? Uh, I think you're gonna have a question probably that'll get to that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. I just wanna jump in on some of that because what you've said, I could not agree with more. But when we look at housing and housing related costs, those are the driving forces when we look at uh, things like inflation. And as a senior, when you add housing and housing costs, maintenance, uh, property tax and all of those things, but you also add the cost of medication or medical equipment and transportation, perhaps back and forth to a doctor or a medical facility, it's important then that we really realize the uh, cost of really maintaining the house and your health. And sometimes those go in conflict and seniors will give up um, food or medication in order to maintain housing. So what are we gonna do about it? And uh, Frank, I'll, I'll let you add that a little bit later, but we have to encourage, or at least one of the things I would like to see is that we encourage health facilities to document the effects, both physical and mental, on our homeless seniors. So we can know or have a clear picture of what is it doing to them physically and mentally, emotionally, and then report out on some of that because there's no doubt that they are suffering because of these housing and housing related um, concerns that they are trying to address. Uh, the reason why I mentioned that is my daughter is a um, registered nurse at one of the facilities and I had no idea and, and I'm I fall in that category as a senior over 65 over 70 well over 75. You can stop there Barbara. Okay thank you thank you somebody <laughs> stop me. Yeah. Uh, she mentioned to me the number of seniors that are actually released from hospitals that have nowhere to go. They don't have a home to return to. They have no, and I was totally stunned by that because in my little world, I thought when you're released from the hospital, you either go home or you go to your children's home and they take care of you, but that is not the case. So we definitely need to make sure that we're addressing those concerns. And um, actually they were, they were identified earlier, um, as Megan, not Megan, as um, as it was brought to our attention to make rental assistance, make it universal, um, build affordable and public health, those kinds of things we need to address and we need to address now. So I, I, I think those are some of the issues that we, and let me just say, um, you know how I am, you know who I am. I champion organizing that we need, our seniors need to be organized and we need to have advocates in place to make sure that this happens. Okay, I won't say anything else about organizing until the next time I talk. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay. I actually wanted to jump in and say, I totally agree with um, Frank and Barbara on many of the things it, it is true. Um, we see a lot of clients come in um, with the tax delinquency. It's, it becomes very hard 
to understand, you know, and, and for the senior as well, like I've worked so hard to pay this home off. Now I'm battling trying to pay the delinquent property taxes. And like Diane mentioned also though, it's because they lost the, uh, there's a death of a loved one or a divorce. And I think a, a bigger barrier too is education. Many seniors don't know um, what um, they have access to. Right. So for a senior who may not have ever even dealt with their finances before, and their spouse or partner may have dealt with the finances, and now they find themselves in control of the finances, and they just don't know what to do. They don't know about homestead. They don't know that you can get on easy pay for your taxes. So just, I believe, eliminating some of those barriers, as well as many older adults, they've worked very hard, but are very prideful as well. And they don't want anyone to know or they're embarrassed about their financial situation. So they don't know how to actually reach out for the help. Um, many homeowners, like Frank had mentioned, the homes being in disrepair, we had a client who um, was almost um, barricaded in his home because his front steps had just torn apart and he had no way to get in and out. Um, but then there's the also financial barrier of letting their homeowner's insurance lapse because sometimes it could have been wind damage, it could have been a storm, but without the homeowner's insurance, now they don't have um, another way to be able to um, fix um, those repairs. So I believe that just like um, the other panelists said, Barbara and Frank, just addressing many of the issues as it relates to the tax delinquency. Medication is also a very big, big decision that seniors have to make. Either I pay this or I'm not going to be able to provide uh, or get my medication. And so um, I'll just say um, in terms of advocacy, I'll wait, <laughs> as Barbara said, um, and I know Barbara very well. So in terms of the advocacy piece, we still need uh, advocacy and organizing for um, a lot of senior issues. So. Yeah, thanks. So, so Sally. if you don't mind, I just have a few things to report about this um, from a code enforcement standpoint. And of course, when we look at this issue, um, wanting to age in place, we're, we're looking at it from two lenses, you know, rental and home ownership. And from the home ownership side, one of the barriers is housing values. You know, there's no access to credit or there's not enough equity in the home to, to make those changes that need to be made for that person to be able to age safely in that home. From the rental side, I think Frank reported it well, we've had an explosion of investor purchasers, especially in multi-unit buildings, which typically would have been these accessible elevator buildings for seniors. Um, and that's all changing. You know, they're not wanting to invest in their buildings. We've we've had an issue here in Cleveland with a number of buildings where the city has had to file a receivership action. And, and even today, even though we have a receivership action in one of the buildings, we have seniors living on the eighth floor with no access to an elevator. They can't get down to get their groceries. They can't get their meds. They can't, their trash isn't being properly removed. And so all winter, we were seeing buildings without heat and many of these house seniors. So it, it's an absolute crisis. It's a code, there's a code enforcement solution to some of the multi-unit building problems. But I think we need to be asking ourselves right now where there's so much funding out there with ARPA money that's filtered down to cities. How are we deploying that money to encourage what we want, which is an increase in affordable housing units, the ability to help our seniors age in place safely in their existing homes, even if they don't have the equity? And how can we work with banks to make that happen and to make those you know, financeable in, in areas that we know have been redlined for generations um, and not just from bank lending, but also insurance redlining, which is a true thing. And um, I had a couple of seniors reporting that at a meeting recently, that they can't get insurance on their homes which just makes it impossible to get any financing for anything else. So th that's something to think about as well. Great. Thank you. So we've, we've identified some, we've identified some of the problems and, and some of the barriers. So, so ba based on that, um, uh, 
let me start with the funding question. What what are some of the funding challenges that impact that in terms of your ability to address the needs you identified, um, and uh, that, that impact the ability of the older adult to have a secure and sustainable housing in later life? And just open it up to the group. And Diane, please feel free to jump in as well. I do have one thought about that, um, and it, it's similar to something. That, I know that Sally already raised it um, about funding for home repair. Uh, the city of Cleveland did get $500 million in ARPA funds. And I actually, I said this, there was a forum a few weeks ago where I spoke and I, I said that I thought that the city of Cleveland should revisit the amount of money that it was allocating for home repair in light of the fact that there was this recent study door-to-door -door survey that showed a significant increase in these properties that need repair. And of course, the data shows that it, it, you can do a subset of that and say that seniors, older adults are also experiencing that. As I pointed out, it was a doubling 50% or a 100% increase, actually a doubling of the number of senior older adult properties that need home repair. So I'm, uh, I'm not directing this to say, Sally Martin, you should go out and increase the money. This may be above her pay grade. Uh, it's at the level of the mayor and city council, uh, but I'll be blunt and say that I think we may not be allocating enough funding for home repair uh, at this time. I would agree that I think it's impossible for a city to allocate enough funding to home repair. And so I think the challenge is raised to our lending institutions how are we going to leverage that? How are we going to create an evergreen program that's going to help seniors for decades and decades to come with this corpus of the ARPA funds? And I think that's what cities like ours are grappling with now. We don't want this to be a once and done situation. The need is going nowhere. You know, our senior population is exploding. And, we, and that is where we're seeing a lot of the issues with home repair needs that are just completely unmet. So I agree with you, Frank. I think we need to raise the bar and bring in other stakeholders to also have that conversation with. Well, I'm also thinking that banks have a continuing responsibility to restore communities that they have damaged. Um, that is That goes beyond some of these CRA, CBA, all of this, where um, they come in and do a partial something and highlight uh, things that uh, they need to continue doing. Not This is not going to be a one-stop shop where everything's going to come out perfect the first time. But until we insist that banks, until we insist that we hold banks accountable and make sure that they are living up to these agreements, then nothing's going to be done to the extent that really changes a neighborhood or changes a community. We will always have these big gapping holes that we need to that we need to plug, we need to plug up. And I think Diane mentioned some of those things that we need to do. And those are, that's a good list, but we also need to increase that list and find out exactly uh, what it is that seniors would, what would best benefit seniors will probably best benefit the community. And I agree, of course, with um, everything that the panelists have said. But uh, one thing that I did want to mention, um, ESOP and the Benjamin Rose uh, Institute on Aging conducts aging in place workshops um, for seniors as a resource. Um, and so that particular workshop, um, it does assess their home. Um, is it safe? Is it accessible? Um, it's asking seniors those types of questions. It asks um, how to use the equity in their home, educating them on how to do that with either single purposes loans or grants, home equity. Um, and then um, lastly, exploring, exploring the other various housing options. It could be a retirement community. It could be a continuum of care. It could, it could be independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing. So I think um, the workshop there um, is dynamic, and it brings a lot of food for thought for the seniors, some things that maybe they haven't thought of, but also helps them guide in their decisions. So. Thank you. Um. I know one of the things that I think Diane touched a little bit on accessory dwelling units and, um, you know, 
are there are there opportunities to do more things to promote uh, shared housing, shared housing programs, programs to encourage uh, maybe uh, an older adult to take in a uh, a renter in a unit as a way to to supplement some income or or, or vice versa. Uh, there's a number of projects like that that go mm. on in in different communities around the country. There's been a lot of attention on one in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that does a lot of matching of, in that case, a lot of times it's graduate students who are attending the university uh, with residents in the Ann Arbor area that would benefit from uh, the additional income or the um, uh, the social connections that might come with with the additional uh, uh, engagement uh, with with folks in the community. Are, are there other things like, you know, aside from the, the public uh, funding of, of those kind of things, are there other community resources that we should <laughs> tap into or look into or examples you've heard from in other places that you'd like to uh, that you'd like to try out or maybe explore more? Sure, Sally. I have a few thoughts on that. Um, one, there's a zoning um, piece to this. And obviously zoning for greater density is very important. Zoning to allow for ADUs, zoning to allow for you know, this type of construction. The city of Cleveland is probably not entirely unique. Um, having weathered the foreclosure crisis, now having 20,000 vacant residential parcels in our own ownership. This presents a huge opportunity for us to redevelop that in a way that makes sense, especially for populations that are aging. You know, we, we've we gotten a lot of um, feedback lately about the need for visitability, the, the need for making anything that we put subsidy in accessible for, for people of any ability. And I think that's just smart construction. So the, the big barrier is the cost of new construction. And so we're looking at things like modular and how can we do that to allow for first floor living, first floor laundry, you know, the things that people need to survive on one level um, and how, you know, how does having all of this land play into that from a redevelopment perspective? And I think that's, it's really an important conversation and I'm sure we're not alone in the country of you know having municipal land as a result of demolition activity we also have an opportunity here in cleveland and other other areas may as well with properties that have been tax foreclosed and that have come back into our county land banks hands or are in what we call here in ohio the state of ohio forfeited lands inventory where it's gone through tax foreclosure really in no man's land in terms of ownership so lately, we've been having conversations with a wider group of stakeholders about these parcels, which we believe can be redeveloped accessibly for either home ownership opportunities where we've lost so much home ownership and we see much more rental going in. You know, can we create affordable opportunities for seniors and others to become homeowners again um, with this inventory? We're also talking to our public housing authority about this. Well, they're always short on units. How about they buy some scattered site, single family homes and renovate them, make them accessible, and then they have them in their inventory. Um, so we're looking at that as well. Um, of course, now with a little bit of money to do that, this is the time to have those conversations, you know, while we still have ARPA money and, you know, how can we use it for that type of project? Anyone else? Um, we talked a little about the foreclosure crisis um, mm -hmm. and the impact on the the population. Um, what are what are some of the uh, heard some about the challenges? But what are, what are some of the ways that you would like to see us explore uh, ways to address the foreclosure or the potential for foreclosure amongst uh, older adults? Well, you know, in Cuyahoga County. During the, uh, I guess the earlier period of foreclosure crisis, uh, which peaked in, uh, well, from 07 to 2013, perhaps maybe even a little bit later, Cuyahoga County actually had probably one of the most robust uh, foreclosure intervention programs anywhere. Uh, and Benjamin Rose, ESOP was part of that. CHN Housing Partners, Community Housing Solutions, Home Repair Resource Center, and uh, did an outstanding job. Uh, and then when COVID came, 
that same infrastructure really stepped up and helped people with emergency rental assistance. Um, I think it, the thing that's missing from that now, and I knew you were asking about foreclosure, but I, I, what, was, what was on my mind is thinking that we don't have really a tenant advocacy piece or uh, specifically in that mix. And I'll go back to saying that that's, that's a substantial thing that we need to be looking at. Um, were you thinking of mortgage foreclosure in particular though, or, or, or tax foreclosure or both? Well, I, th I think both of those present. So, uh, I mean, either, you know, a tax sale or a bank foreclosure, the, the outcome is yeah. the same, isn't it? Well, so the agencies that they're still doing that kind of assistance and um, some of the advocacy organizations have advocated for them to continue to get funding and that's been successful. So I, I guess we have the ability to do that. I'm going to leave it to maybe my other colleagues and panelists to say, what do we need to do more of for that? So I'll just say from my experience, what has shifted since um, you know I began is we used to have what's called a single point of contact at the bank um, mm -hmm. that would assist us in allowing or getting a workout for um, the client. There's no longer a single point of contact. Um, we also had um, a memorandum of understanding with banks so that the banks showed that they were in with trying to help that um, client save their home. And so we don't have that. And so just having that, mm -hmm. that big of a shift, it seems like two small things, but those two things are very, very impactful when someone is facing foreclosure um, because if you have that single point of contact, you're not now talking to 10 people, telling 10 people, you know, your situation and trying to get a resolution. You have a person that is actually actively working with you to come up with a solution. And so I think we need to go back to having a single point of contact and also having memorandum of understandings with the bank to show um, to something that Barbara, uh, to, to Barbara's point, to show that, you know, many of the communities that the banks that are in to help those residents in the community stay there, you know, um, and be able to live comfortably. So that's what I would say. I think what happens when you have that single point of contact is you actually build a relationship and there's a respect for each other. You, you, there, and in that relationship comes trust. And so when that recommendation comes, as opposed to just turning down things, people are more willing to work, work it out because I trust who I'm working with. I trust and value their opinion. So I'm going to go just a little bit further to make sure it happens. We do things for people we like. We make we break rules, we stretch a little bit further, we do those things. And once that single point of, of contact, once that relationship was broken down, then every time you started, you started new. You started with someone you didn't know, you started with somebody who didn't know you. And it, it really began to erode the process because that relationship had been destroyed. And I, I have a question for Antoinette, if I may. So in some respects, this is a perfect time to be raising something like this because both the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County are about to enter into agreements where they will uh, leverage the deposits that they have and ask banks say, you know, what are you willing to do for us if we give you our billions of deposits? And they're both engaged in those conversations right now. But the likely candidates for those depository institutions are pretty much the major banks. And I guess the question for you is, in your experience as uh, doing counseling, if we had those agreements with, I'll just say, I'll use names, Key Bank, Chase, U.S. Bank, if we had them with those, would that be enough? Or do we need to be looking at who are the mortgage servicers that are actually uh, doing, uh, that you need to deal with? I mean, I, so I think my experience, I think if we had those, that would help because what okay. I found is once one gets on board, then mm -hmm. a few others are going to follow yeah. suit, right? 
And so if even if we had those and we've had those um, memorandum of understanding, and I know Barbara remembers those days where we had it with Chase, we had it with U.S. Bank, we had right. it with Aquin, and we had it with those, you know, um, lending institutions. So we just need to get that back. Well, the, the greatest avenue that's open for this is with the county. Mm -hmm. uh, Greater Cleveland Reinvestment Coalition has been in discussions with the county, has submitted recommendations, and is and is really participating with the city of Cleveland. Uh, I think there's still some question. There's been the door has been knocked on, mm -hmm. but it's there's not a, really an engagement and conversation. But I think if we could get to that. This these this is something that could be put on the table for sure. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad, can, you, glad you brought it up. Yeah, anything I can do to help with that, please uh, let me know. I know I've been missing some GCRC. My, my schedule has been super full, but yeah. would love to re-engage in that. Okay. I, I think too, this is the time to have those conversations. I just agree with that so much because I think we're on the cusp of another crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think our, our speaker said it, very well earlier, you know, the only thing that kept us from this eviction tsunami was all the subsidy. And I think that's what's keeping us from this mortgage foreclosure tsunami that's about to come. Um, you know, we've seen a run up in our home sale prices here in Cuyahoga County, and it's eerily similar to what happened before the bottom dropped out of our market. You know, irrational bidding wars and things like that on houses that need restoration work, you know, so almost it's it's just the same thing, you know, it's deja vu all over again. And I think we better be ready because it's going to look different and it's going to come hard at us. Um, here in Cuyahoga County, we still have a program to help people with delinquent property taxes, and that has about $1.7 million left in it. And that's saved a lot of people. But we have around 50,000 people here who are tax delinquent on their properties, and we know where that leads. Um, and also, you know, they, they can't invest in those homes. They can't get a loan. They can't get any grant money. Um, so, yeah, when that money runs out, we better be ready. And housing counseling is our, our first uh, our first line of defense there. Thanks. And I guess that's a big concern for me is what do we do when the money runs out? When 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 their permanent emergency rental assistant program, when 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 that money that was temporary, when it runs out, are people still able to sustain their homes? So should there be something that goes past just that, but goes into counseling and making sure that we're stabilizing people so that they can move forward? Even when we offer the tax credits or even when we um, give money to, um, to, sell, to assist with taxes, what is the next big thing that we that we don't see that's right behind that that we need to be addressing? I mean, I helped you with your taxes, but is your front porch also falling apart? Is your roof leaking? What is it that I need to do in order to make sure that I'm I have my arms wrapped totally around you so that I pull you out and keep you out? Um, my dad used to say, if a car gets stuck on the railroad tracks, it's not going to be very helpful if you just help them halfway through. Mm -hmm. You need to pull them off the track. Absolutely. And I know one of the things that ESOP does, and we do try to take a holistic approach because we do realize that our client, clients come in with, not, with facing more than one issue. And right. so those are the questions that we're asking. Is there another resource that we can get you to because what at the end of the day, what we want to do, we want to make sure as many of your problems are fixed that we can handle, or even mm -hmm. if it's not in our wheelhouse, okay. to get to the right resource, right, to be able to take care of that. And so I do think that that is important, especially as it relates to budgeting too, because what we want to do, if we've given you the help, we want to make sure that you're no longer in this crisis again. If we, if we can help it in terms of stabilizing the budget, right. looking at that, is there some adjustments that we need to make? So we do try to take that holistic approach and I would hope all of our other, you know, housing partners do the same. So, so I wanna just add in here, there was a, a, a 
one of the comments that came in in the chat actually came from Mike Billitzer, who's the director of the ESOP program. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal Mike's question. He says, given the gravity of the crisis and the role the banks can play, are there requirements or reinvest or uh, within the Community Reinvestment Act with the banks that we need to more fully uh, explore or use to bring uh, the, the banks to the table to be a part of this conversation? I know we've talked about the bank some, but is there anything specific to the Community Reinvestment Act that we would need to focus on here uh, in addressing the housing issues? You know, well, in some, go ahead. Yeah, I was just, no, I was just going to say that you had identified or we identified 16 commitments, um, although there's more than that. And, and Frank, I'll let you speak on that because I, I know you've done extensive work with the uh, you know, there, it, there's, I sort of look, I look at this in two ways. One is what the Community Reinvestment Act requires. And then I look at it like, well, what other leverage might be gained separate from the Community Reinvestment Act? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Community Reinvestment Act isn't the strongest piece of legislation. It's just unfortunate. It, it can be very powerful when a bank is going to merge with another bank or acquire another bank, they have to get approval from their regulator. And that's a point in time where you may be able to have some advocacy. But I think that the what's emerged uh, over the last decade or more is this idea that can local governments, separate from CRA, can local governments use the millions or billions of dollars that they have on deposit to basically uh, encourage banks to operate differently, change their behavior, change their policies and practices. So I'm, I, in a way, I know I'm not answering Mike's question directly. I suppose if I were to answer directly, I'd say we should pay more attention to when do banks submit applications to the Federal Reserve, the Comptroller of the Currency, <clears throat> the FDIC. When are they submitting applications to do things <clears throat> that do trigger a CRA evaluation. And I have to admit, I'm probably not paying attention to that, but I know there's a way to do that. And we should probably do that more. And maybe Greater Cleveland Reinvestment Coalition, uh, we should talk about that mm -hmm. as to how the coalition gets on top of that. Well, I think if um, our friend Chip Bromley from Organize Ohio was here today, he would have a lot to say on doing organizing and letter writing about CRA generally and filing complaints against banks for not lending in the community in which they have deposits, which is the spirit of CRA. The reality of CRA, it's a little bit like buying carbon offsets. You know, you do these investments and you get a little checkbox and, oh, you're doing great with CRA, but the spirit isn't there. The actual lending in underserved communities isn't there. The investment there isn't happening. And I think he would have a call to action here to say, all the banks have regulators. Regulators are required to get feedback from the community about how those banks are performing. And often they don't, it's just crickets. No, because it feels like a bureaucratic thing and how do you send the letter and how do you address it and what are you supposed to say? But they do read those letters. And I think those letters have weight to them. Um, and so I think the community has a role here. And I know with GCRC, this was an effort that Barbara is spearheading to really call attention to the lack of lending or disparities in lending in the community. Um, and it's been a small but very mighty group. And I think if, if that could be amplified in some way, it, it does get attention. And I think it's gotten attention here in Cleveland. And we, we've seen some progress with it. Not enough, but some. Oh. Okay, thank you. So I want to, uh, the next question, sort of shift to a little more of the conversation that Diane talked a little bit about the homeless crisis and some of the transitional mm -hmm. housing issues. And maybe we can, we can spend a few minutes talking about this. I think in my my perspective is that, that the programs that provide emergency shelter or transitional housing um, often struggle to address the needs of an older adult population. Um, so I guess two two parts of this. What are some of the challenges you see in working with an older adult who is uh, attempting to access resources at, from emergency shelter or transitional housing? And then the second part of that, what are some things that we should be looking at to improve the service or improve the support for those populations 
uh, in those settings. Let, let me just start with, a, with something is that, first of all, we got to take the shame out of it, okay? I um, um, am the founder of something called Another Chance of Ohio, and what we do is we make available to people anything that is donated to us, we make it available to people free. If you only knew how many of our seniors um, will shop, we're there from 10 to 2, Monday through, through Saturday, but we do put things outside. And some of our seniors have actually visited us every day outside. They've never been inside the store because they're ashamed. They don't want people to see them come. We're there from 10 to two, but things are outside. I have checked my ring because it's gone off at 11 and 12 o'clock at night, one o'clock in the morning, six o'clock, because they're getting things before anybody can see them. Now, I know some of them are sleeping in the car and that's the reason why we put things outside so they can get a blanket, they can get this. They can also get food. They can kind of make it as comfortable as possible in the car. But somehow we have got to address um, this sense of shame and let seniors know that it's okay to need help and that we're there to help. We cannot talk down. We cannot say, well, you know, look at them and say, well, my God, you're 60 years old. In 60 years, you haven't been able to get a house. You haven't been able, nobody wants you. Your kids don't want you in there. Your grandkids don't want you. What have you been doing? What did you do? and some of them have done nothing wrong. We also know that there's a lot of seniors, some seniors who come inside the store and the store opens at 10, they'll be outside at 9.15 and they'll store close at two and they'll sit there to two o'clock. And I, I have cautioned our, our managers that if that's what they wanna do, let them do it. We don't know if your gas is off, if your electric is off, if your husband hit you, if you hit your husband, if your children are going crazy, we don't know why. But this is where you feel comfortable. This is where you're warm, the electric is on, you see people coming in and out. We're gonna talk to you as long as you wanna talk. And if you don't wanna talk, you can just sit there and watch people walk back and forth. But I know for a fact that a lot of our seniors feel shamed or ashamed of where they are. I, I have a couple anecdotes from my work that are really pretty sobering. Um, the first week that I started at the city of Cleveland, I had to testify in front of the Senate Banking Committee with Sherry Brown. And the reason I was testifying was because of investor behavior and what the ramifications were to cities. And this was something in my prior role at the city of South Euclid that was happening far too often. So an investor would come in and purchase a single family home that had a tenant already Ooh. in it. So in, as an example um, that I used for them was a, an elderly lady who lived with her sister who had dementia. She was taking care of her sister. She was also taking care of her grandchild. So there was wow. a, two elders and a, and a grandchild in the house. She had been in the house for 17 years and she had a housing choice voucher. So she was getting Section 8 subsidy to be able to stay in this house. The new owner did not want her there and gave her a non-renewal. He would not renew it. Um, she had a month to month lease, unfortunately. And he said, well, you have 30 days, you need to get out. She couldn't find another place to live. And the day came and the bailiff put her out of that house and she was trying to load her sister and grandchild into the car. Her sister fell. Her sister fell to the ground. Um, no one seemed to care. Um, and it was um, absolutely horrifying. Her possessions were left there. She had nowhere else to go. She ended up finding a place for her granddaughter and her sister, but she could not find a place for herself. And she lived in her car for a matter of months. So We've also seen here in Cleveland where, you know, we have a multi-unit building and it's in deplorable condition and we uh, need to demolish it, but it's it has occupants and we need to relocate those occupants. Well, what we've come to learn is that there's a lot of barriers to the shelter system and to find emergency housing vouchers and so forth. 
sometimes requires spending time in shelters. So this would require breaking up a couple if they're together and the woman goes to one shelter and the man goes to another. And many people say, well, I would just rather live in my car than go through that. And I think that that's one of the tremendous barriers um, that we face. And, you know, one, one of the things the city is involved in is the, um, the, the Harvard Brookings Community Leadership Institute. We were one of 10 cities internationally that were part of that and dealing with an intractable problem. And several of the other cities were foreign cities. And, and one that we spent a lot of time talking with was Helsinki, Finland. And what was really insightful is several of the American cities had their main problem as homelessness. You know, how do we address this? We're seeing seniors, they're sleeping out in front of our library. And seeing the foreign cities like Helsinki just looking at us like we were crazy, how is it you have this homeless problem? I mean, this is a right. People have a right to have a roof over our head. And of course, you know, we don't have a homeless problem because we find a way to house all the people. And I think this is the challenge. It's disgraceful in the United States that we have people who are homeless, especially elders and seniors. I mean, it, it just it's just unthinkable, but it's true. Um, and it's a growing burden um, that we're facing. And I think, you know, we, we need to wake up to that challenge. Thanks. Oh, sorry, Frank. I'll also add that um, just something to what Barbara said in terms of taking the shame out. And I just recall in one of our team meetings, the staff was pretty frustrated because they had a couple seniors that they couldn't help. And they said, I just, we just, we just feel like we're spinning our wheels, you know, we're not helping. And so I had to remind them to just you making the call to the senior and listening to them. Because one of the things that we need to do, especially decision makers, is to listen to the senior. Because before they become homeless, they're really telling us already the challenges that they're facing. But no one is listening to them to be able to get them a solution before, you know, they then become homeless. So for me, I think we really have to put our active listening ears on to our senior population hear their needs, their true needs, because they're telling us. They may not be telling us in a direct way, but they are telling us their needs and what they need from us to be able to age comfortably and be patient and more empathetic. So that's what I would say to that. And that's going to release some of the shame and have them open up a little more. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, you know, as I've as we thought about that issue and kind of the describing it and some of the challenges, I also think there's a challenge within the existing within the existing services in terms of the ability to accommodate the mobility limitation of an older adult. Um, you know, you have somebody maybe who is uh, a, a frail senior, maybe who is is in the situation of being homeless because of the death of a spouse or the loss of the other person who was a family caregiver or in, in some setting for them. And the idea that you would, you know, need to seek shelter in a, you know, in a property that maybe doesn't have an accessible entry because of where some of the buildings have to be, or would require you to sleep on an upper bunk because that's the way you can get the numbers of people into the rooms that can be there. So there's some, there's some mobility and accessibility challenges, I think sometimes to this that we need to think about as a part of how you address the population. Uh, which is other reasons why people are not comfortable going into a shelter setting. I, I think another part of it to me is that, you know, so much of the model um, as, as, as we consider the, where people are in their life's journey. And that if the, if the person is an older adult, um, you know, it's, it's not an employment or a job training program. The reason for the situation is different. And often we don't really have we don't really have a service model that speaks to them that you know the the um, the the supports that are available for somebody maybe who's a victim of domestic violence the menu of those services really aren't aimed at an older adult who is the victim of financial abuse or uh, is 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 a situation of self neglect just because they've they've outlived the other members of the household so I think there's there's some opportunity to talk about the problem. Uh, in thinking about how it's a different scenario and a different solution for somebody who's maybe um, 
finds himself in that situation for the first time in their 70s, as opposed to somebody who finds himself in that situation because they've emerged from the foster care system at age 18, or they uh, are someone who is recovering from a substance use uh, issue, or there's someone who's been incarcerated and is now back in the community. Mm -hmm. All of those are very challenging, but they're not necessarily things that are directed at the population of older adults in the conversation about transitional housing and emergency shelter. So I get your response to that. <laughs> you know, the, unfortunately, there's just no answer, is there? I yeah. mean, I, I think that the silence is, is deafening in that regard. We don't have the answer to this, but we need to. Yeah. Thank you. And oh. then I guess it's how do we get to the answer? And I think that um, Antoinette said it, that we have to talk. We have to communicate with seniors. We have to listen to what it is that they need and what is the expectation. And then we have to look at other resources. Um, I, um, as far as where am I going to send you or who do I call uh, when you don't really fit right in this box when I can't say, okay, it's physical or it's mental or it's a safety concern. When, when it's across the realm, where am I going to send you? And that I think still comes from um, speaking. And I, I do believe that seniors would withhold quite a bit of information mm -hmm. unless they feel comfortable in talking about it. And that is on us to make seniors know that we're there for them, that we're there to help. So yeah, it it, it is, a, a, a I think it's a very tricky um, situation and how we're gonna deal with it and, and, and in what way we can deal with it is probably a multitude of, of ways to deal with it, but we don't have one that has been proven. And that's what I think we're, we're, we need to make sure that we are addressing, how am I really helping you? And even when we talk about the homeless, we also have to consider there's a whole group of people who are on the brink of being homeless. Seniors, families, how are we going to really make this work for seniors and those that are, are that will be homeless tomorrow or next week? I know that, you know, um, I wanted to mention intergenerational housing. I think that that is something that could assist um, in the uh, emergency housing situation with seniors. I know for myself, we have our in-laws, my in-laws that have, you know, transitioned over with us, um, but many families don't have that. And, and so then the question still becomes, then what do we do and where, what other resources can we give to those individuals? And like Barbara said, because it may be that their children may be on the brink of homelessness themselves and, and can't afford to even um, take them in. So what do we do with those seniors? Um, but definitely we need to have um, more affordable or, and more accessible housing for, um, for seniors because it's just not. And I know Diane mentioned public housing, but to someone's, to someone's remark, a lot of seniors, and I've heard it for myself on a daily basis, many are not feeling safe to go to public housing. And I know it varies from state to state, but in Cuyahoga County, a senior does not want to go into public housing um, because they just don't feel safe. Okay. okay. So um, we have, I think we have time for just one more uh, discussion topic. I want to offer this out to, to everyone. We've, we've heard a lot of information today, some great data uh, in Diane's presentation and then the follow-up and the conversation that we're having now. So what what would be the takeaway? What's, what's the most important thing that we should be doing or we should be thinking about to promote safe, affordable, and accessible housing for older adults? What's what's the one thing? What, what, oh, you opened yourself up to that. <laughs> I did. So uh, I'm coming with organizing and advocacy. Take our concerns to the polls and let our votes be heard. 
organizing and advocacy. I thank you for letting me say that again. But I, I think it's very important that we do let seniors know that they are still in control, that they still can add to their own safety, to their own housing, to their own success. And that if they get involved and we keep them involved and we show them different ways that and different things that they can do, that they will they will uh, belly up to the bar. Oh, that's probably not a good one. Uh, but anyway, they'll they'll do what they need to do in order to sustain themselves. Great. If not the bar, then the voting booth. Okay, that's good. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's hard to follow. But who's next? Well, I'm struggling. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm struggling to come up with one, the single thing. Uh, but but yeah. also one thing I thought of in answering this question. You know, what's the one thing to do to promote safe, affordable, accessible housing for older adults? <clears throat> in light of the things that Diane presented and even some of the things that I presented earlier, uh, you, we might almost say it's the same thing we would do for other vulnerable populations, underserved populations. Mm. If we can, and, and so, for example, uh, renters, you know, there's holding investors accountable. And uh, actually, to, to the credit of Director Martin, who's on this panel, she's convened a group that is going to be proposing, I think, a half dozen pieces of legislation to city council at the end of the summer recess, which will go a long way to holding investors accountable. And that's for any people that are vulnerable, but it would certainly benefit older adults. The Cleveland Tenants Organization, if we could bring back a robust tenant advocacy <clears throat> organization, yes, that would help all vulnerable tenants, but it would surely help older adults who are in that population as well. And then for the homeowners, um, the home repair, access to greater home repair resources, yes, that would help all the uh, vulnerable populations on the east side of Cleveland, for example, but it would yeah, for sure probably disproportionately benefit older adults. And then the issue of access to home repair loans, which we've talked about quite a bit. Um, you know, if we were to increase access to those loans for vulnerable populations generally, older adults would certainly benefit from that. Uh, but I'll go back to, if I were to come back to just say, well, it's gotta be one thing, I'll go with Barbara's uh, organizing and advocacy and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, if we think about those memorandums of understanding that Annette, Antoinette talked about, ESOP was probably, of all the groups in Cleveland, was the most successful in getting really strong agreements with lenders and, and mortgage servicers to uh, rewrite loans. They didn't get that by being nice. They, you know, there's that phrase, if you want an omelet, you got to break some eggs. Well, ESOP broke a lot of eggs, <clears throat> and they were... They used direct action tactics. It was very uh, public, <clears throat> but that's what lending institutions responded to. And if we have to do it again, I don't know that we should be shy about it, if we have to. Barbara won't be shy about it. I know that. <laughs> Good, thank you. And I, I'll just add just more federal funding. I think um, if we could get that on the ground quicker to be able to provide um, this vulnerable population with assistance quicker, I think that would really, really mm. be a game changer as well as the organizing. I, you know, I think we have an obligation to <clears throat> keep this front and center. The statistics are speak for themselves. You know, the the population is aging. This is the need. There's not enough affordable housing. I think Diane's presentation says so much um, mm -hmm. that the conversation needs to be um elevated to the federal level for sure you know tenant protections why are all the individual cities having to pass tenant protections the city of cleveland did pass pay to stay we're definitely working on source of income protection but if these were national rights and we took a housing first approach i mean and that would be the the conversation we just need to keep escalating and escalating until they can't not listen thank you so, well, I uh, just want to say how uh, much we appreciate the opportunity to have conversation today. Uh, there was some great uh, 
comments and, and questions in the chat. Uh, for those of you that left a question, there were a few that maybe had a, a technical response or an answer. We'll make sure that we get those answered and out to the group. Um, but I uh, want to again thank our uh, our speaker today and, and Diane Yentel for leading us into a great conversation. And I want to say a, a special thank you to Frank and Sally and Antoinette and Barbara for a really robust uh, response and communication around that and some great food for thought for things we should try to do next. And um, this is a great this is a great example of what a policy lecture presentation should do to get us to think about the next steps and things we should be part of. And thank you so much for letting me be a part of it today. I'm going to turn it back over to Ashley for some closing remarks. And uh, again, thanks everyone for being part of today's program. Thank you, Orion. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Dorian. I just I want to take a, a quick moment. There was one question that came through that I, I did want to um, submit to the group really quickly. So everyone talked about organization, organization, advocacy. Um, we know that those are effective tools. At what point do we institute those strategies? When when in the crisis does it become important for us to start using those strategies and, and who do we target specifically? I, I would say you can, I mean, if if organizing an advocacy starts with just being mobilizing a group of people to develop their voice in a position, uh, I'd say do that yesterday or immediately, anytime. Exactly. Uh, the, the more finessing question is, you know, at what point might you need to escalate to do something more confrontational and direct action. I think that depends on the group group mobilizes and has a position and you don't get a response. You get blown off, you get, you know, you, you just get dead air. Uh, then you have to think about, okay, are we just going to go home and say that's the end of it? Or are we going to do something more and call a press conference or whatever we have to do? And then who you target, it's, you know, there's lots of them out there. There's investors, there's banks. <laughs> Uh, and unfortunately, at times, it may even mean looking at uh, some current partners in government. If exactly. the government entity is not moving forward with policies that are needed, you may have to nudge them a little. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a tricky thing to do because they're often your partners as well. So you got to be delicate about that. Yeah. And that's often our local and national leaders, um, our yeah. uh, elected officials. We, I, I would say that there's no time you shouldn't be organizing because there's no time that there's not a crisis somewhere. So, but in this particular issue, we should have been organizing some time ago, um, as Frank said yesterday. And then you up the ante depending on the response. What is it that people are doing or not doing? Um, and you will be able to formulate a lot of things simply by their lack of response or their response you will be ready to move forward. And some of that's gonna take training. And so, I mean, like any good Boy Scout or Girl Scout, you gotta stay always ready. I, I wanna acknowledge the exhaustion that takes place trying to follow all this stuff and squash mm -hmm. the stuff that's yeah. terrible. And I think the, the state budget for Ohio was a great example of this recently. You know, the budget came out one way and then when it went to the Senate, it was completely reworked and all kinds of atrocious things that would have impacted affordable housing were added into it. And it took a Herculean effort among um, advocates to, to mm -hmm. get some of that taken out. But you had to watch it. You just you never know when these attacks are going to come. Um, so I think keeping it front and center, also knowing that people love stories. You need to tell mm -hmm. firsthand stories. It's very yeah. impactful. Um, and also have your statistics. And that's that's powerful and making sure we stay on top of those things so that we're ready to advocate at any turn and be effective mm -hmm. at it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And and I guess maybe we can close with Barbara, advocate, advocate, <laughs> advocate. So. <laughs> Thanks All so right. much. If someone okay. needs it, I have a few sharks that I don't mind sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Those are historic relics. <laughs> well, we do want to thank everyone for joining us today for our 17th annual CAT policy lecture and for all the great questions that were presented. 
Um, we all, we heard the data, we understand the urgency now, and we've received the call to action. So um, I think what happens with the crisis at this point is in all of our hands. So I do want to thank all of our panelists. I want to give a special thank you to Missy, uh, Missy and Sol again for the wonderful presentation and just um, the insightful messages um, that I think that were all really well received. I was looking through the chat and everyone really enjoyed the presentation. So thank you all for joining us here today. Um, we do want to ask that um, you help us improve future programs by taking a moment to complete just a really short survey. The evaluation is voluntary and your answers will not identify you in any way. So if you'll look in the chat, you can access the evaluation by clicking on the link and it's also going to be emailed to you following today's lecture. Okay. I do want to invite everyone to attend our free upcoming events. Um, they're listed here on the screen, and if you would like to receive more information or to register for any of these events, events please be sure to visit our website, www.benrose.org. Again, thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to see you again next year. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you to all of you, and thank you, Diane.